Welcome to Let's Therapy, where we get real and raw about your mental health, faith, and blended family. We're your hosts, counselors, Scott and Vanessa Martindale. Now let's therapy. Hey guys, welcome back to Let's Therapy with Scott and Vanessa Martindale. We are so excited to be here with you today. Yes, and you guys, before we get started, just remember that this podcast episode is not a substitute for your mental health. If you're suffering with some mental health issues or having a hard time, guys, we just recommend that you reach out to your local therapist or a licensed professional. Absolutely. And guys, we've covered a lot of topics on here, but today we're going to dive into substance abuse. And this is probably one of the more common things that families deal with, uh, simply because a lot of times they are so hidden and generally get uncovered usually at the worst times or when it's become something that is uncontrollable. So we're going to go out and look at some risk factors. We're going to look at some commonalities and really just kind of, again, our hope is that that this puts at the top of the mind that you start to recognize there, if, if there is a problem, where to go and seek the right help. Absolutely. So what are the most common types of substance abuse issues? Like, what do people struggle with the most, Vanessa? I would say some of the issues uh, that we hear about most are typically, um, you know, alcohol, uh, drug-related, especially with teens. A lot of uh, teens, uh, you know, we hear a lot about marijuana, smoking marijuana, Mm -hmm. or vaping is another type of substance, Um, even pills. Yeah, a lot of... Well, over-the-counter medication. Yeah, a lot of over-counter medication. Even medication that's abused, such as Adderall or Ritalin or uh, stimulants, are often um, mm-hmm. abused. We see. I would see that a lot when I was a nurse. You know, when we would be in the ER, things like that. You have um, a lot of people who are overdosing on just even over-the-counter medication. Yeah, and the, the hard thing about this topic is it, it usually starts off more innocent. Sure. Like people don't intend to get connected or addicted to a substance. Yeah. So it may be, you know, you're you're used to having that one drink in the evening, uh, which turns into two, which turns into four, which turns into you're drinking from the time that you uh, come in the door to the time that you go to sleep. Yeah. Uh, for pain medication, which we see do see this a lot, and this is a growing epidemic, you know, you could have had an injury that uh, maybe you hurt your knee and you're taking pain pills. Well, all of a sudden you become so reliant upon them that it you can't stop taking them right and it starts disrupting you the normal world it starts disrupting your normal day yeah so really what we're talking about is that there there are five uh stages of addiction and there's are five stages of getting ready to seek help for addiction let me say it that way there's the pre uh contemplation stage Mm -hmm. and then there's actually contemplating and this is more getting ready and then preparation and then there's action and maintenance. So if you're in a situation where you either A, you feel like you are addicted to a substance or maybe your spouse or your kids may be addicted to the substance, uh, just first understanding that those are the stages an, an addict would go through. Right. Um, before we do that, though, I want to kind of touch on how do you know it's a problem? So I, I, I'm going to speak. We're going to try to speak from two different sides here um, from a maybe a spouse's perspective, Mm -hmm. and then I'll speak from a parent's perspective. From a spouse's perspective, when do you know that there's a problem? Yeah, I would say um, anytime it starts to interrupt your ADLs, which is activities of daily living. So Mm -hmm. when you're no longer getting up to go to work or you're calling in, you know, to work a lot. If you're missing um, family functions or things for your kids, things like that. Um, If you notice frivolous spending, that the the financial financials become an issue, Um, lack of sleep or they're sleeping too much. Mm -hmm. Um, It could also be appetite. You're seeing a lot of appetite change, Mm -hmm. Um, change in behavior, Mm -hmm. Um, things that they were once passionate about that they're no longer passionate about. Um, These are just, you know, some signs and symptoms, so to speak, that you can see where, you know, your, your spouse, may um, maybe having uh, some issues with uh, substance abuse. Yeah. And from a parent's perspective, and I know a lot of parents look at their children and they're like, okay, is there a problem? Do I see a problem? Um, I think there's a lot of things we can look out for. You had mentioned a couple with spouses, immediate changes in behavior or changes in normal patterns, things that they used to enjoy doing, they're not enjoying anymore. I think a lot of times with teens, there's there's such a normality with them uh, excluding from the family. So they like to go into kind of their dark places and where they feel safe, maybe it's in their room, but maybe you feel like they're just not ever coming out of there. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely changes in grades too. So these are all just kind of warning signs. 
Uh, there are also some hereditary things or some some predictors that we can look at, right. such as if there's a family uh, history of this. If there's yeah. a family history, you need to keep your eyes open. Yeah. Uh, if they've been diagnosed with some type of mental health disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we talked about lack of, of family involvement and early use. If they start early in life, you know, if sure. they're drinking at 14, 15, 16, we can predominantly tell there's going to be an issue later on well in parental attitudes as well I know you know we know that you know that some parents and and we've experienced this a lot when counseling kids some parents have a more lax approach yeah. some parents um are the parents that hey as long as I have everybody's keys they can drink at my house mm-hmm. you know it starts off something subtle like that we hear that a lot um with the kids that we see who are su- who are struggling with substance abuse, it's not always that they're trying to hide it. It's actually that sometimes the parents are okay with that or even um, uh, promoting it in some situations. Yeah, I think there's a tendency, and I don't want to step on too many toes without trying to step on toes here, but there is a tendency to try to be the cool parent mm-hmm. and to, to try to be your friend, to be your child's friend first, parent second. Um, and we just say from a counseling perspective and somebody who sees these things happen quite often, that's a dangerous road to take. Sure. And, um, and maybe you, you mean well, but again, it's just a dangerous, dangerous road to take. So we've kind of identified, you know, what are the warning signs, kind of how to predict it. Let's talk about kind of what we can do in terms of treatment and, and maybe what, you know, steps you can take. Um, so this is, I would say, a very different avenue than probably your normal counseling treatment. Sure. Because substance abuse issues tend to be a little bit more severe in nature, especially if they've reached that point of pure addiction. So that's why there are specific programs. There are 12-step programs that you can go into, Mm -hmm. intensive inpatient programs where somebody can go and be completely immersed in a recovery uh, atmosphere where they, they're in a controlled atmosphere. Right. And we, we do feel like those are very useful, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the uh, onset. Sure. So if you're like, I'm seeking treatment, the first thing I want to do is I want to find, uh, an, whether it's alcohol or an addiction program, that I can completely immerse myself in so I can get free from this addiction. Right. The follow-up from that is more repetitive counseling. Sure where you can find somewhere you can connect with, find ways to cope, find ways to work on behavior modification. These are the things that lead to that onset of addiction. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you said coping and behavioral um, because I think a lot of it stems from that and a lot of it can stem from our upbringing and it's just negative coping, you know, coping mechanisms Mm -hmm. or coping skills. We don't know how to uh, cope in a healthy way, um, where as we're a reliant on you know a substance to make us feel better or mm-hmm. to num- numb certain feelings, um, you know. And you guys, looking at this from a spiritual perspective, um, I love in Thessalonians five six through eight. It says, "So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep sleep at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as the breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet." It. And I know in here that it says, um, and those who get drunk and get drunk at night. And so in this, it's not necessarily just for drunk, but I would, I would look at this as a, pers- from a perspective of just addiction and different substances. Mm-hmm. Um, and whenever we put on that, um, the, the, um, the helmet of salvation, it's the things that are protecting our mind. And when we put on the breastplate that is covering our heart. So if you think of heart and mind, and that's where the enemy goes to attack us the most, mm-hmm. it's in our mind and in our hearts. And so, um, just remembering that, um, you know, when we are able to be sober minded and, um, not have those toxins, so to speak in our body, um, we can think clearly, we can see clearly, we can hear clearly from God. Um, because the enemy all day wants us, um, to mistrust the heart of God. He wants us to uh, mistrust who we are in Christ. And so, um, by, um, you know, um, making those choices to, you know, fall into substance abuse, or, um, maybe we don't even mean to fall into it. It's just something, you know, it's a slippery slope and something Mm -hmm. that happens. He can use that, um, to destroy our hearts and minds and our relationships, our marriages, um, you know, our, our blended families, things like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And the, the, the thing I want to leave with today is this, and one of the things that I've kind of, I should have probably covered a little bit earlier, but the, one of the things that just kind of dawned on me is if you're if you're hearing this and you're thinking okay my spouse or my child has an issue here 
But when I bring it up, all they do is deny it sure. and usually maybe turn it around on me. And I think a lot of times people address this and they, they address it kind of pointing a finger. They're like, you need to get help. You need to do this. You need to stop doing this. And through studies and through research, one of the best ways to approach this is not to necessarily point out to them, but make sure that you're explaining how that makes you feel. Yeah. Like, I feel really helpless when you're in this situation. Yeah. I feel like um, like something bad's going to happen when you're in this state of mind. Yeah. So, again, if you're struggling with this area, as we said before, you know, there are, there are ways that you can find help. There are ways that you can seek out a, a addiction treatment. And we just yeah. encourage you to do that. Yeah. We encourage you to look at this from a, you know, it doesn't have to always be this way. You can make changes. Your Absolutely. spouse can make changes. Your, your children can make changes. And hopefully through this podcast, you've just learned just a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, enough that you can start taking an action. Absolutely. And you guys, if you have any topics or any questions for us, please email us at info at blendingkenyanfamilies.com. We would love to discuss those and um, get back to your, um, get, get you some answers back to you. You guys have a great and wonderful day. Be blessed in all that you do.